Were grammatical errors present in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon? Were Book of Mormon temples used primarily for assemblies rather than for sacred ordinance work? Did a resurrected God with a physical body come down to earth to take on flesh as a man? How important were Urim and Thummim in translating the Book of Mormon? Were plants and crops mentioned in the Book of Mormon present in the pre-Columbian era? We will attempt to answer all these questions in today's podcast. Hi, Max here. Welcome to the Come Follow Me podcast. This review covers the lesson plan for Mosiah chapters 7 through 10. Please subscribe to be notified of our upcoming videos. For the sake of time, I won't cite all the parallel phrases and words from the Old and New Testaments that are in the Book of Mormon text. While it can be argued that some of the parallels are only a coincidence, most are so strong, it is impossible to not conclude that their true source is the King James Version of the Bible. For a complete transcript of this lesson, please click on the link in the description below. As we begin, let's set the context for this story. About 79 years previous to Mosiah chapter 7, a group of men left the land of Zarahemla in an attempt to return to the land of Lehi, Nephi, where the ancestors had once lived. That expedition fought amongst themselves, and all but 50 were killed in the wilderness before returning back to Zarahemla. After returning, they gathered another group and left again to find the land of Lehi, Nephi. And that group was never heard of again. See Omni 1, 27-30. At the time, Mosiah the second took over as king of the people in Zarahemla. Mosiah 7, 1. As we begin this chapter, King Mosiah the second is wondering what happened to the men in that group, especially since a number of his people have been constantly asking him to send a party of men to discover their fate. The phrase, quote, the space of three years is also in James 5.17, and, quote, was desirous to know, is in Esther 11.12. Mosiah 7.2. And it came to pass that King Mosiah granted that sixteen of their strong men might go up to the land of Lehi-Nephi to inquire concerning their brethren. Mosiah 7.3 And it came to pass that on the morrow they started to go up, having with them one Ammon, he being a strong and mighty man, and a descendant of Zarahemla, and he was also their leader. The Ammon here was not the same Ammon we will meet in chapter 27 who will become a mighty missionary. The words, quote, strong and mighty, are in Psalms 24, 8. As we get back to our story, let me make it clear that sometimes they call the land the land of Lehi-Nephi, and other times it's just called the land of Nephi. The terms were used interchangeably. Mosiah 7, 4. And now they knew not the course they should travel in the wilderness to go up to the land of Lehi-Nephi, Therefore they wandered many days in the wilderness. Even forty days did they wander. The number forty seems similar to the number of years the children of Israel wandered. This begs the question, why didn't they just take the brass ball compass with them to point the way? The words, quote, even forty days, are in Numbers 14.34. Mosiah 7.5 And when they had wandered forty days... They came to a hill which is north of the land of Shilom, and there they pitched their tents. Mosiah 7, 6. And Ammon took three of his brethren, and their names were Amalekai, Helam, and Hem. And they went down into the land of Nephi. Mosiah 7, 7. And behold, they met the king of the people who were in the land of Nephi and in the land of Shilom. And they were surrounded by the king's guard, and were taken, and were bound, and were committed to prison. One of the most frequent grammatical errors Joseph Smith made while translating the Book of Mormon is the use of the word was instead of were. In the 1830 edition, page 169, it read, quote, And they were surrounded by the king's guard, and was taken, and was bound, and was committed to prison. So, was was changed to were in the latter editions. Mosiah 7, 8 after two days, they were brought before the king to be questioned. The words, quote, bands were loosed, are in Acts 16.26. Mosiah 7.9. And he said unto them, 
Behold, I am Limhi, the son of Noah, who was the son of Zenith, who came up out of the land of Zarahemla seventy-nine years ago to inherit this land, which was the land of their fathers, who was made a king by the voice of the people. Let me briefly summarize what happened to the people who left the land of Zarahemla seventy-nine years before. They were led by a man named Zenith. When the search party arrived in the land of Nephi, they were welcomed by the Lamanites who were now in control of the area. The Lamanites secretly plotted to let Zenith's colony settle in the land of Nephi, make the land productive, and ultimately force these Nephites into bondage by living off their labors. At first, the Nephites thrived in the land, until the Lamanites began their efforts to subject Zenith and his people into bondage. The Nephites fought them off and maintained their independence for about 40 years. As Zenith grew old, he turned his kingdom over to his son Noah. We will learn in a future lesson that Noah turned out to be a very wicked king. He replaced the righteous priest with wicked men to serve as priests over the people. One of these wicked priests was Alma. The corrupt reign of King Noah and his priest weakened the colony of the Nephites. And that enabled the Lamanites to then put Noah's people into bondage and live off of their labors. Noah was eventually killed by his own priests, and one of Noah's sons, Lemhi, became the next king. Lemhi inherited the kingdom that had to pay 50% of everything they had to the Lamanites. This was the state of affairs at the time Ammon and his companions found Lemhi and his people. Thus, the Nephite colony in Lamanite territory had three kings during the 79-year period, Zenith, Noah, and Lemhi. We will now return to Mormon's account of what happened after Ammon's group found Lemhi and his people, land of Nephi or Lehi-Nephi. We are now going to learn why Ammon and his companions were arrested so quickly. The king was concerned for his own safety, and we find out why as the story continues. Mosiah 7.10 The words, quote, without the gate, is also in Hebrews 13.12. Mosiah 7.11 the words, quote, permitted to speak, are the same in Acts 26.1. Mosiah 7.12 And now when Ammon saw that he was permitted to speak, he went forth and bowed himself before the king. And rising again, he said, O king, I am very thankful before God this day that I am yet alive, and am permitted to speak, and I will endeavor to speak with boldness. Mosiah 7.13 Ammon proceeds to tell the king why they came from the land of Zarahemla to find out what happened to those who Zenith led out of that land. The phrase, quote, If ye had known me, ye would not have, is similar to John 8.19, and, quote, Up out of that land is the same in Exodus 3.8. Mosiah 7.14 Hearing this made Lemhi exceedingly glad, and revealed that the Nephites in the land of Zarahemla still exists. Limhi and his people are facing very difficult times themselves, as he will now explain to Ammon. His hopes have been raised that Ammon and his people of Zarahemla will rescue them. The phrase, quote, of Ammon he, is similar to Judges 10.18, and, quote, said, now I know of a surety, is also in Acts 12.11, and, quote, on the morrow, is also in Acts 25.17. Mosiah 7.15 For behold, we are in bondage to the Lamanites, and are taxed with a tax which is grievous to be borne. And now, behold, our brethren will deliver us out of our bondage, or out of the hands of the Lamanites, and we will be their slaves. For it is better that we be slaves to the Nephites than to pay tribute to the king of the Lamanites. The words, quote, grievous to be born, are also in Matthew 23, 4, and, quote, will deliver us out of, are in Daniel 3, 17. Mosiah 7, 16, King Lemhi told Ammon to get the rest of his party from the hill and bring them into the city where they can rest from their journey and eat. Mosiah 7, 17. And now it came to pass on the morrow that King Lemhi sent a proclamation among all his people that thereby they might gather themselves together to the temple, to hear the words which he should speak unto them.
More than likely, this temple was the same of which Nephi and his people built in the land of Nephi, as recorded in 2 Nephi 5.16. There were only three temples mentioned in the Book of Mormon. This one is in the land of Nephi, or Lehi-Nephi, one in the land of Zarahemla, and one in the land of Bountiful. While there is mention of these temples, it seems that they were mostly used for open assemblies or a gathering place to hear the word preached, with no mention of sacred ordinances being performed such as marriage sealings or ordinances for the dead. The phrase, quote, proclamation among, end quote, and, quote, that thereby they might gather themselves together, end quote, are similar to Ezra 10.7. Mosiah 7.18 and it came to pass that when they had gathered themselves together, that he spake unto them in this wise, saying, O ye my people, lift up your heads and be comforted. For behold, the time is at hand, or is not far distant, when we shall no longer be in subjection to our enemies, notwithstanding our many strugglings which have been in vain. Yet I trust there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. With the arrival of Ammon and his companions, Suddenly, there was hope for deliverance. Mosiah 7.19 King Lemhi tells his people to put their trust in God, that same God who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Mosiah 7.20 And again that same God has brought our fathers out of the land of Jerusalem, and has kept and preserved his people even until now. And behold, it is because of our iniquities and abominations that he has brought us into bondage. We can see the symbolism in this verse of their sins bringing them into spiritual slavery. The words, quote, the same God, are similar to 1 Corinthians 12.6, and, quote, because of their iniquities, are also in Isaiah 64.7, and, quote, brought us into bondage, are similar to Galatians 2.4. Mosiah 7.21, the words, quote, ye all are witnesses this day, are similar to Ruth 4.9. Mosiah 7.22 Lemhi reminds his people that because they are in bondage, they have to pay 50% of their corn, their barley, and grain of every kind, and of their flocks and herds to the Lamanites or they will be killed. In the 1830 edition, page 170, it read, quote, And this he done for the sole purpose. End quote. This was later changed to, quote, And this he did. End quote. The words, quote, of our flocks and our herds are similar to Nehemiah 10.36. Mosiah 7.23-24 Limhi reminds them that they have great reason to mourn over their losses. Mosiah 7.23, the phrase, quote, grievous to be born, is also in Matthew 23.4. Mosiah 7.24, the words, quote, yea, I say it unto you, are also in Matthew 11.9 and, quote, their blood has been spilt, are similar to Psalms 79.3. Next, Lemhi points out to his people how they got into this predicament. Mosiah 7.25 For if this people had not fallen into transgression, the Lord would not have suffered that this great evil should come upon them. But behold, they would not hearken unto his words, but there arose contentions among them, even so much that they did shed blood among themselves. The words, quote, would not have suffered, are also in Matthew 24, 43. Mosiah 7, 26, speaking of Abinadi, And a prophet of the Lord have they slain, yea, a chosen man of God, who told them of their wickedness and abominations, and prophesied of many things which are to come, yea, even the coming of Christ. Another common grammatical mistake in translation is the use of the word is when it should read are. In the 1830 edition, page 171, this verse read, quote, and prophesied of many things which is to come. So is was changed to are. Mosiah 7.27 And because he said unto them that Christ was the God, the Father of all things, and said that he should take upon him the image of man, and it should be the image after which man was created in the beginning. Or in other words, he said that man was created after the image of God, and that God should come down among the children of men, and take upon him flesh and blood, 
and go forth upon the face of the earth. The words, quote, God the Father of all things, are similar to 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and, quote, after the image of, are also in Colossians 3, 10. Does this verse seem a bit confusing? Joseph Smith taught in D&C 130, verse 22, that God has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's body. This doctrine was placed into his story of the first vision with God and Jesus both appearing to him in bodies of flesh and bones. That became the doctrine of God, which is essential, because if we're going to become like God, we come to this earth to get bodies, so we can become exalted gods who have immortal physical bodies. Mosiah 7.27 is saying that God himself is going to come down to earth and become a man. Who is it that did this? Jesus. It says Christ is God. He is the Father of all things. Isaiah 9.6 says, quote, He shall be called Everlasting Father. End quote. And God has to take on the image of man, meaning a physical body of flesh and bones and blood. But if God had already had a physical body, how can he take on another physical body? See the confusion? Mosiah 7.28 and now because he said this, they did put him to death, and many more things did they do which brought down the wrath of God upon them. Therefore, who wondereth that they are in bondage, and that they are smitten with sore afflictions? Speaking of Limhi's people, the phrase, quote, the wrath of God upon, is also in Revelation 16.1. Mosiah 7.29 for behold, the Lord hath said, I will not succor my people in the day of their transgression, but I will hedge up their ways, that they prosper not, and their doings shall be as a stumbling block before them. The words, quote, my people in the day of their, are also in Obadiah one thirteen, and, quote, I will hedge up, are the same in Hosea 2.6. Mosiah 7.30-32 Lemhi teaches that if his people sow wickedness, they shall reap destruction. Mosiah 7.30, the words, quote, They shall reap the chaff thereof in the whirlwind, are similar to Hosea 8.7. Mosiah 7.31, the words, quote, And again he saith, is also in Romans 15.10. Mosiah 7.33, However, Lemhi teaches that there is a way out of their painful situation. But if ye will turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart, and put your trust in him, and serve him with all diligence of mind. If ye do this, he will, according to his own will and pleasure, deliver you out of bondage. Mosiah 8, 1-2 When King Lemhi finishes his speech to his people, he invites Ammon to speak to them about what has happened in the land of Zarahemla over the past 79 years. Mosiah 8, 1 The phrase, quote, He spake many things unto them, is also in Matthew 13, 3. Mosiah 8, 2, the words, quote, before the multitude, are in Luke 9, 16. Mosiah 8, 3. So Ammon spoke, as he repeated King Benjamin's last sermon in the land of Zarahemla, to them as well. That speech, as you recall, is in Mosiah chapters 2 through 5. The phrase, quote, that they might understand, is in Luke 24, 45. And, quote, all the words which he spake is similar to Acts twenty thirty eight, Mosiah 8, 4. When Ammon was done speaking, King Lemhi dismissed the crowd and sent them away. Mosiah 8, 5 through 6. And it came to pass that he caused that the plates which contained the record of his people from the time that they left the land of Zarahemla should be brought before Ammon that he might read them. Now as soon as Ammon had read the record... The king inquired of him to know if he could interpret languages, and Ammon told him that he could not. Mosiah 8, 7-9 through 9. King Lemhi tells Ammon about sending several men in an attempt to find Zarahemla. Lemhi had hoped to get help from the people of Zarahemla to free his people in the land of Lehi-Nephi, but his men got lost and found themselves in the ruins of the Jaredite civilization, whom they knew nothing about at the time. Lemhi's men discovered 24 gold plates and brought them back to Lemhi. Because they were written in a language they could not understand, Lemhi wondered if Ammon could read them, but he could not. 
We will learn later in our study of the Book of Mormon that these plates were a record of the Jaredites. Eventually, Moroni will translate and abridge these plates, which will become the Book of Ether. When Ether had finished his record, he hid them so the people of Lemhi would eventually find them. See Ether 15.33. Mosiah 8.7 The words, quote, grieved for the affliction, is also in Amos 6.6, and, quote, journey into the wilderness, is in Exodus 3.18. Mosiah 8.8 8. In this verse, and no less than five more times in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, is the abbreviation ampersand C, meaning, and so forth, used. It is hardly believable that such a symbol as ampersand C was a translation from ancient writings. This kind of mistake is clear evidence of a recent origin of the book. The words, quote, bones of men and of beasts are similar to Numbers 31.11, and, quote, the hosts of Israel are the same in 1 Kings 2.5. Mosiah 8, 10 through 11. And behold also, they have brought breastplates, which are large, and they are of brass and of copper, and are perfectly sound. And again they have brought swords, the hilts thereof have perished, and the blades thereof were cankered with rust. And there is no one in the land that is able to interpret the language or the engravings that are on the plates. Therefore I said unto thee, Canst thou translate? So Ammon finds ancient swords. If swords existed in pre-Columbian America, why is there no evidence of them today? Mosiah 8.12 King Lemhi asked Ammon if he knows anyone who can translate these 24 plates. Mosiah 8.13 Now Ammon said unto him, I can assuredly tell thee, O king, of a man that can translate the records, for he has wherewith that he can look and translate all records that are of ancient date. And it is a gift from God, and the things are called interpreters, and no man can look in them except he be commanded, lest he should look for that he ought not, and he should perish. And whosoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called seer. These interpreters are the Urim and Thummim. Here is Joseph Smith's description of the interpreters and an account of how he received them, which is recorded in Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith's History, 135. Quote, there was a book deposited written upon gold plates giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from which they sprang. Also that there were two stones and silver bows, and these stones, fastened to a breastplate, constituted what is called the Urim and Thummim, deposited with the plates. And the possession and use of these stones were what constituted seers in ancient or former times and the God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. End quote. These were supposedly given to Joseph Smith by the angel Moroni. Joseph used the Yarm and Thoma to translate the first 116 pages, which included the book of Lehi. Once the pages were lost, God confiscated the Yarm and Thoma from Smith. He was left to translate the rest of the gold plates with his stone and a hat. As a note to verse 13, from the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, page 173, the word had has been deleted and the words not ought has been rearranged to ought not in latter editions. It used to read, quote, lest he should look for that he had not ought and he should perish, end quote. The words it is a gift are the same in Matthew 15, 5 and, quote, that he ought not, are also in Acts 25.24. Mosiah 8.14 And behold, the king of the people who are in the land of Zarahemla is the man that is commanded to do these things, and who has this high gift from God. In other words, King Mosiah II is a seer. Mosiah 8.15 And the king said that a seer is greater than a prophet. So a seer is greater than a prophet, for all seers are prophets but not all prophets are seers. The phrase, quote, is greater than a prophet, is similar to Luke 7.26. Mosiah 8.16-17 And Ammon said that a seer is a revelator and a prophet also, and a gift which is greater can no man have, except he should possess the power of God, which no man can. 
Yet a man may have great power given him from God. But a seer can know of things which are past, and also of things which are to come. And by them shall all things be revealed, or rather shall secret things be made manifest, and hidden things shall come to light. And things which are not known shall be made known by them, and also things shall be made known by them which otherwise could not be known. The words, quote, could not be known, are in Genesis 41.21. When this verse says, quote, can know things which are past, end quote, it means the seer can interpret ancient records. The words prophet, seer, and revelator are titles given to the general authority of the LDS Church, including the Twelve Apostles and the First Presidency. No general authority since Joseph Smith has ever translated ancient writings. There was a golden opportunity back in the 1960s when the Book of Abraham Papyri was procured by the church. Instead of using their calling as seers, the church leaders gave that task to a trained secular linguist. And we know how that turned out. If you want to learn more about this, check out our four episodes on this. Or you can go to the Gospel Topic Essays, Translation and Historicity of the Book of Abraham. Those links are in the description below. Mosiah 8.18 Thus God has provided a means that man, through faith, might work mighty miracles. Therefore he becometh a great benefit to his fellow beings. Ammon was referring to Mosiah the second. Mosiah 8.19 And now when Ammon had made an end of speaking these words, the king rejoiced exceedingly and gave thanks to God, saying, Doubtless a great mystery is contained within these plates, and these interpreters were doubtless prepared for the purpose of unfolding all such mysteries to the children of men. The 1830 edition, page 173, read, quote, And these interpreters was doubtless prepared. So was was changed to were. The words, quote, And gave thanks to God, are in Acts 27.35 and, quote, a great mystery, are also in Ephesians 5.32. Mosiah 8.20, the words, quote, should rule over them, are also in Joel 2.17. Mosiah 8.21, the words, quote, and are driven, are in James 3.4. It is easy to get confused chronologically at this point in our reading of the Book of Mormon. So I'm going to explain what we are entering into next. A heading note in the Book of Mormon, just before Mosiah chapter 9, states, The record of Zenith, an account of his people, from the time they left the land of Zarahemla until the time that they were delivered out of the hands of the Lamanites, comprising chapters 9 to 22 inclusive. So chapters 9 through 22 in the Book of Mosiah are a flashback to the days of Zenith and his people as they left the land of Zarahemla 79 years ago to return to the land of Nephi. In fact, the diversion from the narrative is so extensive that it is not until Mosiah 21:28 that the storyline of Ammon and Lemhi resumes. Mormon quotes directly from Zenith's own records from chapters 9 and 10. Mosiah 9 covers 13 years, from approximately 200 B.C. to 187 B.C. Mosiah 9, 1-2 Zenith and his men were sent from Zarahemla to find out the strengths and weaknesses of the Lamanite army in the land of Nephi. Once Zenith saw that there was good among the Lamanites, he didn't want to destroy them. He wanted to make a treaty with them, but his own leaders wanted to kill Zenith for even suggesting such a thing. There was infighting, and most of the group died. The rest returned with Zenith to Zarahemla to tell the story. Mosiah 9.1 the words, quote, but when I saw that, are also in Galatians 2.14. Mosiah 9.2, the words, quote, and austere, is also in Luke 19.21. Mosiah 9.3-4, Zenith was determined to possess the land of Nephi. So he took a group of men and women into the wilderness, and eventually they reached the land of Lehi-Nephi. Mosiah 9.3, the words, quote, our journey into the wilderness, are also in Deuteronomy 2.1, Mosiah 9.5. And it came to pass that I went again with four of my men into the city, in unto the king, that I might know of the disposition of the king. 
and that I might know if I might go in with my people and possess the land in peace. Mosiah 9, 6. And I went in unto the king, and he covenanted with me that I might possess the land of Lehi-Nephi and the land of Shilom. Mosiah 9, 7. And he also commanded that his people should depart out of the land, and I and my people went into the land that we might possess it. As you can tell, the meetings went surprisingly well because the king of the Lamanites recognized an opportunity to work his cunning plan. The words, quote, that we might possess it, are similar to Joshua 24, 8, Mosiah 9, 8. And we began to build buildings and to repair the walls of the city, yea, even the walls of the city of Lehi-Nephi and the city of Shilom. It's obvious that Nephi and his people once lived in these cities. Mosiah 9.9 9. And we began to till the ground, yea, even with all manner of seeds, with seeds of corn, and of wheat, and of barley, and with neas, and with sheam, and with seeds of all manner of fruits, and we did begin to multiply and prosper in the land. The Book of Mormon fails to mention important plants that were in the area, such as beans, squash, avocado, chili peppers, chicken, potatoes, pumpkins, sunflowers, pineapples, papaya, etc. But it does mention seeds, plants, crops, fruits of every kind. Therefore, one would expect to find an abundance of plants brought from the New World by the Jaredites and Nephites. But we don't. Later on, the Book of Mormon speaks of grapes and figs, see 3 Nephi 14.16, which did not exist in the Americas. The words, quote, of wheat and of barley are also in Jeremiah 41.8. Of course, no one knows what Neas and Sheam are. We know that corn and wheat and barley were not present until Europeans brought them to the Americas centuries later. The writer of the Book of Mormon had a habit of inventing new and contrived words such as knees and jim, which were some kind of plant or crop. Next, in retrospect, Zenith points out the cunning plot in the heart of King Laman. We should also note that just as the Nephites named their kings after Nephi for a while, we see Jacob 1.11, so also the Lamanites named their kings after Laman, who was Nephi's brother. Mosiah 9.10 Now it was the cunning and the craftiness of King Laman to bring my people into bondage, that he yielded up the land, that we might possess it. The words, quote, yield up the land, are similar to Matthew 27.50. Mosiah 9.11 Therefore it came to pass that after we had dwelt in the land for the space of twelve years, that King Laman began to grow uneasy, lest by any means my people should wax strong in the land, and that they could not overpower them and bring them into bondage. Mosiah 9.12 Now they were a lazy and an idolatrous people. Therefore they were desirous to bring us into bondage, that they might glut themselves with the labors of our hands. Yea, that they might feast themselves upon the flocks of our fields. The phrase, quote, they were desirous to, is also in John sixteen nineteen, and, quote, bring us into bondage, is the same in Galatians 2, 4. Mosiah 9, 13 through 15, King Laman enacts his plan. He stirs up his people, the Lamanites, to attack the Nephites while they were working in their fields. The Nephites came calling on Zenith for protection. Mosiah 9.14, the phrase, quote, in the thirteenth year, is also in Jeremiah 1.2. Mosiah 9.16, And it came to pass that I did arm them with bows, and with arrows, with swords, and with scimitars, and with clubs, and with slings, and with all manner of weapons which we could invent. And I and my people did go forth against the Lamanites to battle. Somehow, Zenith was prepared with numerous kinds of weapons, some of which he invented on the spot. Unfortunately, there is no evidence for swords and scimitars in the pre-Columbian era of the Americas. Mosiah 9, 17-19 God answered their prayers for strength. As Zenith and his people defeated the Lamanites 3,043-279. to Mosiah 9, 17 The words, quote, Go forth to battle are in 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. And, quote, the Lord that he would deliver, are in Psalms 22.8, and, quote, deliver us out of the hands of our enemies, 
are similar to 1 Samuel 12.10. Mosiah 10, verses 1-5 through 5. After all that bloodshed, Zenith tells his people to stockpile weapons of war and post guards around the land. The men raise crops and their women make clothes. Consequently, they had 22 years of continual peace and prosperity. Mosiah 10.2, the phrase, quote, into the hands of our enemies, is also in Esther 14.6. Mosiah 10.3, the words, quote, 20 and 2 years, are the same in Judges 10.3. Mosiah 10.4, the words, quote, manner of fruit, are similar to Revelation 22, verse 2. Mosiah 10.5, the words, quote, work all manner of, and, quote, fine linen, are also in Exodus 35.35. 35. Mosiah 10.6, eventually King Laman died, and his son prepared the Lamanites for war again. Mosiah 10.7, Zenith's spies saw the Lamanites coming. The words, quote, come upon my people, are also in Amos 8.2. Mosiah 10.8, the Lamanites had shaved their heads and were girded with a leathern girdle about their loins. They were looking wild and ferocious in their leather underwear. More swords and scimitars, but no evidence of these pre-Columbian weapons has ever been found. The phrase, quote, armed with bows, is also in 1 Corinthians 12, 2. And, quote, that they were naked is in Genesis 3, 7. And, quote, were girded with is in Daniel 10, 5 and, quote, a leathern girdle about their loins is similar to Matthew 3, 4. Mosiah 10, 9. Zenith hid all the women and children in the woods and armed every man and boy for battle. The phrase, quote, children of my people, is also in Judges 14, 16. And, were able to bear, is also in Acts 15, 10. Mosiah 10, verses 10 through 11. The Nephites had the strength of their Lord on their side, while the Lamanites depended on the strength of men. Mosiah 10.12 Zenith rouses his troops with a speech about the Lamanites, explaining that They were a wild and ferocious and a bloodthirsty people, believing in the tradition of their fathers, which is this, believing that they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem because of the iniquities of their fathers, and that they were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren and they were also wronged while crossing the sea. Mosiah 10, verses 13 through 16. Zenith goes on to recount all the reasons that throughout their family history, the Lamanites were extremely angry with the Nephites. Mosiah 10, 16. The phrase, quote, as the Lord had commanded him and took, is also in Exodus 34, verse 4. Mosiah 10, 17. Zenith, speaking of the Lamanites, and thus they have taught their children that they should hate them, and that they should murder them, and that they should rob and plunder them, and do all they could to destroy them. Therefore they have an eternal hatred towards the children of Nephi. Mosiah 10.20 Zenith and his people slew them with a great slaughter, even so many that we did not number them. The words, quote, did drive them, are also in Jeremiah 46.15. Mosiah 10.21 the Nephites once again returned to tend to their flocks and till the ground. Mosiah 10.22 And now I, being old, did confer the kingdom upon one of my sons. Therefore I say no more, and may the Lord bless my people. Amen. His son, the new ruler, will be a man named Noah, who will be a very wicked king. And this concludes our study for today. For more, you can find this podcast on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. You can also find us on Facebook and share this post with your friends. Or you can go to our website at talkingtomormons.com where you can download the script and learn much more. Links are in the description. God bless.